Amen. All right. Well, if you guys will turn to the book of Philemon. So, you know, you have all the Colossians and the Timothys. Then you have the book of Titus. And it always feels like Titus leads into Hebrews, but there's actually a book in between. It's Philemon. And uh, we're, we're going to do a study or we're going to do a preaching on the book of Philemon. And because it's such a short chapter, it's 25 verses. And... Uh, we're going to go ahead and just read the whole chapter, and then we're just going to preach a short message on the book of Philemon and a couple of lessons that it leaves us, uh, or that uh, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, wrote uh, to Philemon. But let's go ahead and just read there in uh, verse number one. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apia and uh, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging in every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have a great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I'd rather beseech thee, being such as, uh, such and one as Paul the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee my, uh, for my son Onesimus, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in times past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels." Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Now as a servant, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with, with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thine obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But with all uh, but withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristocrus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Amen. Rent from Rome to Philemon by, one, by Onesimus, a servant. And so we see here, the reason I went ahead and read it is because... I'm going to make some statements in the beginning that unless you've read the entire chapter, you know what's going on at the end, uh, you're going to think that I'm just taking things out of context. But the we're going to go through like we did with the book of Jude. And after Philemon, I, I'm going to have to just do like, uh, you know, synopsis of entire books of the Bible. Because after that, I, I don't know that there's uh, any more books of the Bible that have uh, just one chapter. So if I, if I preach again on a Wednesday, we might just have to do a different type of study. But Philemon is actually uh, a role. It, it's got a lot of good stuff in here. That, that's the easiest way to put it. But the very first thing we want to look at is we're going to go there in the first five verses. And we're going to review a couple of things. Number one, before we even go there, and you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to give you a couple examples. You know, one of the things that I, uh, that I really enjoy about reading, uh, you know, Paul's writings through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost is I love his... His salutations, his intros into, uh, you know, for the brothers in Christ. You know, if you look there in Romans 1, and you don't have to turn there, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God, which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Spirit, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. You know, and he, you know, he constantly is reminding them that he's a servant or he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he does a, a couple of things. You know, we go here to 1 Corinthians. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with 
with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord, for theirs and ours, grace, theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. And so he's always thanking them, he's giving them grace, he's sending them love, and he reminds them that he's praying for them. And I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, I'm, I'll probably just pick one more here. We can go over here to like Philippians. Uh, Paul and Timotheus, the servant of Jesus Christ to all saints. And another thing, you know, there's a, there's a doctrine that I heard many years ago and that has come up, that's crept up as of late. Uh, and I actually heard it from an older Baptist preacher that, uh, you know, I actually wrote off to the fact that he was older and the individual who told me about him said that he wasn't, that he was actually experiencing some form of dementia. Uh, he had, he was on the phone. I never met him personally, but he was on the phone and he had talked to me and he was talking to this individual about how the saints would suffer a thousand years in the lake of fire and then go on to heaven. And I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not. I mean, Pastor Cobb, you've been around a while. You've probably heard of something like that, which was real interesting because the Bible never gives indication towards that. And I remember I was younger. I was new to the faith. And it kind of, it rocked me a little bit. But, you know, luckily I had a good mentor that, you know, showed me scripture and it, it cleared it up. And I never thought about it again. And just as of recent, maybe like a month or two ago, there's a, a church that calls themselves a Baptist church in New York uh, and, and they've had a couple young preachers, and when I mean young, I'm talking younger than us, and I don't even call them a preacher, but I mean, they refer themselves. They run a church, and they're probably in their early to mid-twenties, and they've been preaching things about how not everybody that's saved is a saint, and the people will, if you don't live a righteous life, will suffer. And hell. Well, the Bible is very clear about that, and Paul reminds us that we are saints, those that are saved by Jesus Christ. He says, Paul and Timotheus, the, the servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus I, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer uh, of mine, for you all making requests with joy. And so we just see that, you know, it, it, it might be uh, something that, that doesn't stand out and it's not like a very exciting point, but it is a, something very important is that sometimes we just need to have proper uh, salutation or proper uh, etiquette towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we sometimes, especially nowadays where people have gotten away from maybe some of the, the ways that we, we teach people to introduce themselves, how to treat a brother. You know, the Bible says it to show, you know, to be a friend, you have to show yourself friendly. And one of the things that Paul's very consistent is, is he's very friendly towards his brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, uh, many times you go to church and it's, if the churches are, uh, you know, uh, bigger, you know, they have a lot, two, three hundred members, even sometimes in the thousands. One of the things that, that uh, members complain about the most is this, it's like this cold feeling. You know, I've heard that many times over t in my life where people say, well, I went to this church, but I didn't like it because, well, I went and nobody even noticed I was there. Nobody greeted me. Nobody said hello. And, you know, Paul's always making sure that he's, he's cordial and he's kind to his fellow uh, saints in, in Christ. And then, so let's go there in Philemon 1. It says, Paul, so we know he's, a, he's a, a, in prison right now, right? And he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, and Timothy's with him, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. I love those words, fellow laborer, soldier. It says, and, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thine house. So we know that he's talking to Philemon who who's has church in his house. So a couple of things here just to, to stop is, first of all, there's nothing wrong with having church in your house. A lot of churches start it that way. I think what's wrong is if you think that that's how you're going to continue down, you know, down the years or long term. If your goal is to have church in your house all the time, well, it's not church anymore. It's just hanging out. You know, if you're having church because you, you were sent out into a city where maybe there was uh, nobody there to, to start out with and you're starting from scratch or, or there was no funds to get a, a building or, or have a building, there's nothing wrong with that. But as your church grows and, and, and you start to grow in the Lord, that your goal should eventually be to move out. Now, the church is in the building, but there's nothing unbiblical about having church in your house if it's in a biblical format. And I'm, let me give you a couple of verses here. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 16, 19, you know, the churches of 
Asia salute you, Achille and Priscilla salute you, much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. Romans 16, 5, likewise greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Epaneus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. So I mean, I just wanted to make that I didn't want to make a blank statement without giving you some biblical backing, right? If we're gonna get up here and preach the entire counsel of God, let's give you reason for that. But if you were to read later on, you see that most of these individuals that started in churches eventually, you know, had a, a proper building or a place of congregation because they grew. You know, I mean the book of Acts is filled with thousands and thousands of converts. I mean, the church grew. There's no way that you can have 3,000 converted in one day in, in your tiny uh, house. And what I mean by tiny, it doesn't matter if you have a 6,000 square foot home, eventually you can't fit three, four, 4,000 people in a church, right? Uh, and then let's go to verse three. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. And so a couple of things we're seeing here is, you know, Paul makes sure to let him know, hey, I'm praying for you individually. And that's something that we should do as uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is we shouldn't just have a blanket prayer, you know, Heavenly Father, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that kind of prayer. But Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for my brother, uh, you know, James, and I pray for uh, the family, the Rudolph family, and I pray for the Cobb family. God wants us to pray for individuals in our life. Now, that being said, the Bible also says pray without ceasing. So if there's time where you just have to, you know, you're getting that prayer time in and you're maybe at work or something, you don't have that time, well then pray for your entire congregation. But you know what? If we make time for less important things in life, why not make time for some of the most important things like our prayer life? You know, if Paul's making time, he's in prison and he's suffering and he says, look, I make mention of thee always in my prayers. And then another thing we're going to see here is he says, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. So Philemon is doing a good work for the Lord. I don't know what, uh, he doesn't give us all the specifics of the work, but we know that he's obviously he has to be a soul winner and he has to be a preacher because Paul's hearing in prison of this love and faith, which he has towards the Lord Jesus and which he has towards all saints. And the reason we're going through all this is because another thing that Paul's doing or uh, through this writing is that he's kind of setting up the stage in this letter because he wants uh, Philemon to take back uh, Onesimus, who used to be his servant, and it doesn't give us all the details, but somehow he wronged him and left, and he's saying, look, I'm sending him back to you, and he's willing to come back to you, but let me set this up so that you know what's going on. And uh, that's a real important, uh, I guess, lesson to learn about it sometimes is that you know, we have to be willing to listen to those who are in our spiritual leadership. You know, we might not always agree with those that, that are leading us, but before we jump to any conclusions, we should listen. And Paul's basically making that plea here, saying, look, I'm making mention. He's setting up kind of that stage, right? Let's go to Philemon 6 through 10, and let's just look. So we're, we see first brotherly and loving salutations, uh, but we also see uh, some leadership qualities in Paul that, that uh, we should not only model our lives after, but learn from. You know, there in Philemon 6, it says, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have a great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the, sa of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that, that uh, thee that which is convenient, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bond. So we're going to see a couple of things here. You know, Paul obviously is Philemon's leader here. And he's saying, look, I want this to come from you. He's going to lead, but he's going to lead by planting the option. See, a lot of times we confuse, you know, and you see things in business like the difference between a boss and a leader, or you see things about, you know, leading others versus uh, dictating. And there's a, there's a big difference when, like, for example, Pastor, uh, Pastor Cobb, 
gets behind the pulpit and he has to dictate what the Bible says, right? Sometimes it's going to offend people. It might not rub them the right way, but he's got to preach the entire counsel of God. He's not, he doesn't have time here to hold your hand through the entire process. But one-on-one, -on -one, that might be a different story. And what Paul's saying here is, look, I can, he says uh, right here uh, in verse uh, 8, he says, wherefore, though I might be much bold to, in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient, he's saying, look, I could command you to do this thing, but yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech thee or plea to thee, being such as one. And then he reminds him, the older Paul, now I'm a prisoner in Jesus Christ. Look, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I've begotten in the bonds. And then another thing that stands out right there is, look, Onesimus wasn't saved, left Philemon. You know, there was a contention there. Uh, ended up in prison, so not only that, but he, he ended up doing other bad things. And then what happened is he meets Paul, and Paul leads him to Christ. And, and uh, you know, he says, begotten him in my bonds, right? And, and people have a, uh, you know, I've heard this, and actually the first time I heard it, it actually rubbed me the wrong way. That was uh, my uh, youth or my milk in the word, right? When people say, oh, I, I saved someone. You know, the very first thing you want to do because you kind of get pompous is like, no, the Lord does the saving. I remember saying stuff like that. Jesus said, well, we all know Jesus does the saving, but there's actually biblical backing for the fact that when we lead someone to the Lord, we save them. Because, you know, we are the ones that are calling them. We're pulling them out of the fire. And you don't have to turn there. We're going to be, we're just staying Philemon and then uh, we will skip on to Acts. But for now, I'm just going to give you a couple of verses. In uh, Titus 1.4, it says to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. We see, uh, and I've used this before, you know, in uh, Sunday schools and in other preaching, where someone who leads uh, someone else to the Lord, you're, you're, you're kind of like their spiritual father or mother, right? It says, to Timothy, my dearly, in 2 Timothy 1-2, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Galatians 4.19, he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed into you. So we see here that Paul has this, he's kind of already laying the groundwork saying, Philemon, I have a little bit of authority in the matter because not only did I leave, did I lead uh, uh, one, uh, Onesimus to, to the Lord and he's now saved, but also, you know, I've been your leader for quite some time. So I'm leaving the option to you, but let me make this plea. Let me make this long plea. And here's the plea that he's going to tell him. He wants Onesimus to go back to Philemon and to help in the ministry. Now, we don't, there's no, you know, let's, let's stay with what it says, but we can draw from the conclusion that obviously they weren't on good terms. Or maybe the feeling is that there might not be good terms because Paul's making this long plea to Philemon about Onesimus, right? And so the next point right here is in uh, verses 11 through 15. We see a little bit of contention, you know, versus redemption, right? I think Paul is anticipating what might be a contentious reunion. And maybe even Onesimus told him of things that might have happened. But a couple of things we need to understand is, look, when you're saved by grace and you're ready to take on the whole counsel of God, there's a couple of things that stand out. Onesimus I don't know what he did or what happened in his walk, but he's a man's now. He's a man's man. And what I mean by that is, look, maybe you were raised to be a man by your father. And, I, and I, my prayer is that every child who's a, who's a boy gets raised to be a man and every child who's a, a little girl gets raised by their mothers to be a woman. But there's clear scripture that for us that are saved by grace and biblical scripture that we need to raise our children to be men or women of God, right? And... Onesimus here, he gets saved, and Paul's saying, look, now I'm going to send you back, and Onesimus has to be willing. And I don't know what's going on, because it's got to be serious if Paul's making this long plea, but the fact that Onesimus is willing to show up, regardless of the consequence, means that he has Christ in his life, because that spirit has told him that now he has to man up and own up to his mistakes. We don't know what the mistakes were, but you know what's, what's one of the key qualities the Bible tells us to try the spirits? A key quality of a, somebody that has Christ in their life is that they're willing to own up to the things that they do wrong. It's, it, it's not enough to know that you're, you're a sinner. We all know we're sinners, but it's more important to know that you're a sinner and that you own up to that sin, right? The Bible tells us to confess our faults. That means that at some point we have to own up to something, not our sins, 
but our faults, but we also have to confess our sins to Christ, right? And if we're doing that, that means that we have to be uh, man enough or woman enough to say, look, I messed up and I'm here to make things right. Whatever the, the thing is that they're looking to make right. And we have more biblical principle for that. I mean, there's verses, you know, obviously Jesus, uh, uh, I've, it eludes me right now, but um, I forget the, 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 the character's name in the Bible. But the guy who gets saved and he now wants to return everybody four, four times what he had taken from them. And, and, uh, and I apologize for, for skipping that, but the Bible gives us clear scripture for owning up to your mistakes, right? For owning up to the things that you've done wrong. It, you know, we have consequences in life, but we have to make them right. And then Paul knows that, th and then the other thing that Paul is doing here, and we're going to read those verses, is that he knows that service is better than fellowship. And what do I mean by that? Look, people have come in and out of this church for a long time, even before I started coming here, and before I started preaching behind the pulpit. But I can think of a group of individuals that were coming to church here consistently for for the better part of almost a year and then uh, a new church opened up on the south side of houston and they started serving there and and it's the same thing that happens here we don't feel we feel sad because we lose the fellowship and paul says that here in, in the verses and I'll, I'll read that but i want to set this up but we're happy that they're able to serve consistently and service is better than fellowship. You look, fellowship's important, but you know the Bible makes it clear that our purpose is to lead others to Christ, and that the labor and the work of love is better than the fellowship. And I'm not, you know, uh, downplaying. I mean, I love coming to church and saying hello to everybody, and we have donuts, uh, you know, Sunday mornings, and we have uh, fifth Sunday dinners. But if somebody leaves the church because they can serve better somewhere else, we should definitely be behind that cause. Now, if somebody leaves the church because they got offended or because they didn't like the preaching, well, you know, good luck. Go find your place in life or whatever. But if they leave the church because they will serve better, we should definitely be praying for that success. We shouldn't feel uh, uh, sad or, or left out or lonely because of that. And even though we miss that fellowship, we're happy that they're able to serve. And the reason I bring that up is because those individuals that have now moved on to that church, you know, when they were coming to this church, they were coming only like maybe Sunday morning, right? But now they're going Wednesday evening, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. You know, they're, they're able to soul win on different, because it's closer to their place of work and their place of life and their, you know, where they live. Great. Because you know what? That's more souls won for Christ because the time is fleeting. And I mean, as much as you want to say, hey, I'd like to hang around so we can play Uno or, you know, Checkers or Monopoly. That's not leading any souls to Christ. And eventually we're going to have to answer for our time. And that time, you know, there's a time and place for everything. But most of our time as, as children of Christ should be spent for the labor of the Lord. And so let's go ahead and read that there in Philemon 1, uh, verses 11 through 15. It says, Which in the times past, I mean, which in time past was thee to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. So he's saying, look, I'd love for him to stay. As a matter of fact, I like him. I think he's a good worker. But he says, but without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it, as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. So we see here Paul saying, look, he might have left you just for the very purpose that he met me so that we could lead him to Christ, and now he's profitable to you when he wasn't before. And, he, and then he also makes mention, he says, look, I would love for him to stay here. I'd love for him to, you know, he's a good worker, and I'd love for him to minister here in the bonds with me, but I think it'd be better if he went back and served with you. And that's how it is sometimes. You know, we don't know where God has us, uh, where God has us uh, set out, or why things happen the way they do. And so we don't know why people come and go from our lives. But one thing we do know is that there's always a plan and a purpose. You know, that God has good things are coming to those that serve Christ. And uh, if you want to turn there to Acts 15, 36, I'm going to give you, and I think Paul's doing this because he also experienced some of this, right? In Acts 15, verses uh, 36, go to Acts 15. Uh, there in Acts. 15, verse 36, Acts 15, verse 36. 
He said, uh, the verse says, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and uh, Cilicia, confirming the churches. And so we see here that there's a contention, and I'm not going to go into all of it, right? But basically, they split ways. And Mark, he didn't think Mark, it should have been good for Mark to go with him because Mark had left them before, right? But when we go later on to 2 Timothy 4.11, you don't have to go there. Uh, he says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So I don't know what happened between Acts and Timothy. You know, we, I mean, I, we could go into it, but that's not the sermon today. But it, it went from contention to now Mark is profitable. So, you know, even Paul, he's not just saying, hey, Philemon, I need you to consider this situation. And I know it's tough for you. But he also led by example, right? They say a good sign of a leader is not someone who's willing to lead, but someone who knows when to follow when there's a better leader. And he's saying, look, I've, he's basically led by example. And I don't know if Philemon knows this. I don't want to, I'm not going to add or take away from the word of God. But, you know, Paul does make mention to in a lot of verses throughout the scripture where people, he says, look, take a look at my life and the example that I've set. And so we know that Paul was very good about leading it by example. And this is one of the things that he ended up doing was there was contention between him and Mark, but then Mark was profitable to him later in his ministry. And then one of the things that the, the reason that that stands out is, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1, it says, uh, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as, it, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God would try the hearts. And so the reason I picked that verse is because I, 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 we talked about it, I don't remember, it's been a couple of months, but it really stood out to me uh, that God allows us you know, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. In other words, God has entrusted us and has allowed us to preach the gospel. And then there's contention that it says, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the hearts. And so the point there I'm trying to make is when God allows us to preach the gospel, then we have to, once we try the Spirit, we have to let God do the speaking in our lives. And sometimes we want to let the flesh take over. And I think that's what Paul's trying to say to Philemon. Look, I know it's going to be tough, but, but you've got to try that spirit because it's no longer the same spirit that left you a long time ago. And there is times when people leave church and, and you just think you write them off. That you, you just make a, an assumption because we're human and we're in the flesh and we're like, oh, whatever. And then they come back. And, and they, they say, well, you know, Christ is in me, or I'm trying to do better, or whatever. We have to give time to try that spirit. And the way that we do that is if God's allowed us to preach the gospel, do we see them preaching the gospel? Do we see them laboring for the Lord? See, it's not just enough. I'm pretty sure Paul led many people in that time period to Christ. But why is Onesimus the one that stands out? Because I'm pretty sure Onesimus is the one that's doing the work. He says, look, he would have, been benefit he would have benefited me here. I think it'd be great for him to stay here to do the work with me, but I'm sending him to you. And so, you know, we see that there, there's that redemptive spirit. He's saying, look, I'm sending this guy to you, and I know there's been contention, but I want you to just consider the, the matter. And then, and then we're going to see the close out here. And we see now a picture of salvation. So we see a couple of things. We're seeing leadership qualities in Paul. He's not forcing the issue, even though he knows he has authority and he has spiritual authority because of what he's doing, but he's also letting Philemon make the choice. And one of the greatest gifts that I think God's given us as children of Christ is uh, that we have free will to choose. You know, one of the things we're very careful when we're soul winning is that we don't force anybody to call out unto the Lord. And there are times when you just, you know, man, you know they get it, you know they're there, 
you know they're ready and you know you wish you could just push the envelope and say look just pray with me and get this thing over with but see if we force it did they really get saved or did they just feel pressured into the situation you know we have to let the their free will and the spirit of christ do the work right now we can lead them to christ and sometimes we do that. and there's times where you're just like look you know they get it you know they know they're a sinner they know they need to call on the lord you're like you know i just want to guide you in a prayer let's pray the sinner's prayer let's let's get this thing and they're like i i just don't know if i'm ready and i know you know with my sales training with you know the things that i do in business that i could probably convince them but then i do an injustice to that free will and i think that's what paul's doing here he's like look i'm not gonna i could enjoin you i could ask you of this but i'm not i'm i'm, I'm letting you choose and then we we, we see there in, in uh, verse 16 says not now as a servant but above a servant so now he's saying look when you see onesimus he's not just going to be a servant i want you to see him as a brother beloved especially to me but how much more unto thee both in flesh and in the lord if thou count me therefore a partner receive him as myself so now paul's saying look let him receive that guy as if it was me coming to you i know you love me so receive onesimus like that he says if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee ought put that on mine account i paul have written it with my own hand i will repay it albeit i do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides yea brother let me have joy of thee in the lord refresh my bowels in the lord not and, and i love the way he worded that because you know it's always like not to offend you but then you say whatever the thing is that offends you. And he says, albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Look, Philemon, you owe to me. And I'm not going to tell you that you owe me. But in order for me not to tell you, I have to remind you what you, what you owe me. You know, what he, that's what's basically what Paul's saying there. But if we look at that, he's, he's making a plea for Onesimus. And he's saying, look, whatever debt is owed to you because of that, whatever happened, I'll pay it. You know, it's a good picture of salvation because how do we get into heaven? What's well, dead is it the dead that we can never pay? It's the debt of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ paid it all so that we can just call on the name of the Lord and go into heaven. There's nothing that we can do. Romans tells us that if it, if we think salvation is, you know, let's just go there. I wasn't uh, thinking of these, but go to Romans four. I love these verses. I know I use them with you guys a lot, but you know what? They're just a great set of verses because one of the biggest things, the biggest argument, the biggest movement for false religion is a works-based salvation and the bible tells us there in romans 4 4 now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt in other words we can't pay that debt the debt of eternal uh, life can never be paid by us it was paid by the blood of jesus christ and i mean obviously here paul is not paying a salvation debt but he's paying the debt of servitude and saying no longer you should treat him like that you should treat him as a brother like you treat me right and he says look i love you and i think this guy'd be great for you and i want you to take him in your fold and use him for your ministry as if it was me coming to help you out and uh, you know the bible tells us there in romans 27 and proverbs 27 you don't have to turn there we're, we're about to close out 27 and 1 and 2 says boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth let another man praise thee and not thy own mouth a stranger and not thine own lips and honestly i mean that could be like the the whole synopsis of this whole chapter because you know we don't know what philemon was doing before or after all this but the bible's telling us look don't think that whatever happened that you can predict the future the only things that we can predict are what god told us in his word and then the other thing is we shouldn't go around telling people how good or how well we serve or the great things we do the bible says let another man praise thee and not thy own mouth a stranger not thy own lips in other words it'd be better if you guys you, the reason that you're sitting in the in the pews today is not because you because i came up to you and said i'm a good preacher as a matter of fact i don't even know if i'm a good preacher or that i know the words are good and i don't know that i know the word as much as other people but the reason you actually listen is because pastor cobb has given me that platform and you guys uh trust his leadership you have faith in his leadership and you have faith that he's taking the time to try this spirit that's behind this pulpit right now right it's not because i came and i'm like hey you know i went to bible school and i got this certificate and i have a phd and an ma and a ba and a psa and a elemental you know i don't here's my here's my resume listen to me no it's because pastor cobb has given me his you know basically he's given me that pad of approval right he's passed the torch 
But it's, that's what he's saying. Look, let not another man praise thee and not thy own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. See, whenever we go around boasting ourselves, what do, what do people, they get annoyed, right? Because what they're thinking is like, this guy just thinks, well, who is this guy? Where'd this guy come from? But if somebody says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to somebody. And have you ever done that? I mean, you, you, all, you already like the person. You've never met him. Man, I want you to meet this guy. He's just unbelievable. I mean, the guy's just on fire for the Lord. He knows the, the Bible. I mean, I think if you guys work together, you could do great things for the Lord. Man, you're looking forward to meeting this guy. You know, there's nothing like posturing somebody, especially if there's a leader in Christ posturing that person. And so let's just close this out there in Philemon 121. Uh, you know, and we see then the recognition, right? Uh, it says, Having confidence in thy, in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that thou, that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristocrus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant. So we see a couple of things here. First of all, the, the verse 21, he says, Look, Philemon, having confidence in thy obedience. So he's almost making a like a like a preemptive statement, like a closing statement, saying, Look, I'm sending this guy to you, and I know you're so obedient that you're gonna take him in, and not only that, but you're gonna do more than I than I think you can do. And so what I mean, what do you do when you when you get this? It's it's, it's like if Pastor Cobb called me and said, Look, uh, I'm gonna send somebody to train under you. And man, I know that, that, that you're going to do such a good job with this guy. You're going to do such amazing things that I'm not even worried if you like him or not. <laughs> what kind of choice would he leave me? I mean, even if I didn't like the guy, you know, the leadership's told me that, that that's what's going to happen. You know, and that's that respect that he's expecting or that, that, uh, that mutual respect they have for, for each other. And then the other thing that really just stood out to me, it says, uh, There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. We see that, that several people are in prison, several uh, laborers of Christ are in, in prison with Paul. So it's not just Paul who was in prison. Everybody that was preaching the word of Christ was in danger of being in prison. You know, we're going to get to the day, I think, again, where some of us will be in prison. You know why I think that's going to happen? More so uh, in the future than it may be in the past is because nowadays everything's watered down. So you know who's going to be throwing it in the prisons? Our fellow Christians, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who, who don't like the, the tough parts of the Bible. You know, and they get a little offended every time you speak a little bit tough on the Word of Christ. I'm not saying they're the only ones. The Bible says, that, you know, everybody in the world will eventually, you know, go, go astray or there'll be a great falling away. But you think about it today, and I mean, there's churches that just don't like this type of preaching. They call themselves a church, but it's very watered down. And anytime you preach hard on the Word of God, they get offended. Oh, you know, you shouldn't preach on the sodomites. Or you shouldn't preach on abortion. It depends on when, you know, Trump voted for the, you know, stuff like that. That's what, and then the other thing it says there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your, I mean, uh, sorry, verse 24 says, Marcus, and, and uh, I don't know if that's Mark, the one that was profitable to him, uh, you know, but it is a Marcus. Aristocrus, Demas, Luke is my fellow laborer. So there's, he's naming other people and he's recognizing them. And, and you know, we, we can go through scripture. Paul calls out people for both good things and bad things. You know, Paul's, Paul's one of those uh, uh, characters in the Bible you see, those individuals that just, he, wasn't, he didn't mince words. And he was really tough. I mean, you think about in a day and age where you don't get communication, there's no phones, there's no Facebook, there's no email. This is a tough letter. You know, I mean, because you don't know the state of Philemon, you know, at that moment. You just know he's a fellow brother in Christ. And it doesn't tell us how much time they spent with each other. We don't know how close friends they are, but obviously they're close. But there's a tough letter saying, hey, not only am I sending this guy back who was your servant, he's saved and he's ready to work for you. And I need you to take him back. And any debt he has, you, you just send me the bill. Well, I mean, if you guys are really good friends, are you really going to send Paul the bill? I mean, he's basically putting them in a, in a tough situation. Now, he has faith that Philemon is a laborer in Christ, a fellow soldier, and that Philemon won't take this the wrong way. But we don't know, right? Not from all this, but obviously, if he wrote it and it's in the Bible, it's safe to assume that Philemon 
took in Onesimus and that they did great things for the Lord. Because I don't think that God's going to put a, a, a set of scripture in there for our imagination to go astray. Because if God does everything for a purpose, and his purposes are perfect, right? And his will is great, so that we can do great things for him. So I don't think, you know, it's, we shouldn't put the human spin on it. If God puts things here, it's for us to learn good lessons. It's not for us to be hold bitterness or murmur or gossip. So this type of lesson here, this type of letter is saying, look, this is how strong the bond is between two brothers and sisters in Christ, or two brothers in this case in Christ. So, you know, we should just look at being friendly, uh, having good, good co communion with our brothers. We should look at learning some leadership qualities from Paul uh, and how to be redemptive, how to forgive. The Bible tells us to forgive. He says, you know, forgive them like I've forgiven you. It's not enough to just ask for forgiveness, but we need to have a forgiving heart. And sometimes people are like, oh, the hardest thing for me to do is to forgive. You know what? Sometimes you got to forgive. Even if you don't want to, you know why? Because God's commanded you to forgive. I mean, that's just the bottom line uh, the bottom line truth. And then there's always a picture of salvation. I mean, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the greatest message that's in the Bible is that picture of eternal salvation, that picture of uh, living by faith. You know, to Abraham it was counted a righteousness, to Moses. And then after Jesus came, what did they do? They just preached Jesus. Even when they were told not to preach Jesus, guess what they did? They preached Jesus. And that's what we're instructed to do is, what do we preach? We preach Jesus. And, what, and what's the final thing? He recognizes fellow laborers. We need to recognize those that are out there working with us or fighting the good fight with us. It's not just enough. As a matter of fact, most of the time, we shouldn't even spend time talking about our great deeds or whatever we think we did great. Because to be honest with you, we probably compared in the eyes of God, they're not that great. But we can look at others that are doing great things for Christ. We can look at others that are preaching the Word of God. We can look at others that are leading souls and are leading great ministries. And we should back them and we should posture them and we should say, Hey, look, that guy's doing a good thing. Forget everything that everybody's saying because anytime you're doing something good for the Lord, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to talk bad about you, right? And, and they're going to say, Oh, that guy, oh, he's, he, did you know he preaches against the homosexuals? Well, yeah, because that's the Word of God. Well, okay. But did you know that, that uh, he says that you shouldn't judge? I mean, that you should judge and just judge by the Bible. But the Bible says judge not, except that they only read that one part, right? Judge not, and they forget the rest of the verses that explain what that means and all that. But that's what we really should look at, right? If somebody's going through persecutions, tribulations, uh, you know, uh, trials, probably that's a good person to back. Somebody's getting all the success, and, and they got the nice car, and, and they got the... Uh, the nice home and the book tour and everything, you probably ought to stay clear of, of that situation. That's why Pastor Cobb and I don't go and hang out with uh, Joel Olstein on a very regular basis. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we don't hang out with him. I just, let me clear that up. We don't hang out with him at all, not a regular or irregular basis. There's no basis for that. Just, just want to make sure that that didn't get taken out of context. But let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach uh, today to uh, congregation and just to be able to preach at all and I appreciate the lessons here and uh, Lord I pray that uh, you know we were able to know when to lead and we're able to know when to follow and Lord we're also able to know when and how to posture other brothers and sisters in Christ and Lord also just teach us to know that the things that happen in our life are for a reason and that we should always just jump to conclusions without scrutinizing your word studying your word seeking you in prayer seeking counsel from uh, a multitude of uh, counselors in Christ and knowing what to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.